Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health, uh, and I'm joined today by Ken Meyer, the Acting Commissioner of the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Department at the City of Chicago, as well as Dr. Geraldine Luna, uh, Medical Director at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, I'll provide remarks first in English, um, and then uh, Ken Meyer will give some more detail, and then Dr. Luna will provide some uh, remarks in Spanish, and then we'll come back for questions. So there is a lot going on in COVID. I first want to highlight that we have updated the travel advisory today, and you see that most of the country now is in orange, uh, meaning that they're averaging more than 15 daily cases per 100,000. Uh, we now have 39 states and three territories included. We added Minnesota, New Jersey, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Utah, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. As a reminder, unvaccinated people who are traveling from these states and territories uh, should obtain a negative COVID-19 test result or quarantine upon arrival. And I just want to note that although much of the country is orange, there are parts that are worse than others. And particularly where you look at Florida, Florida is now averaging more than 100 cases per 100,000 per day. So more than six times uh, what we're seeing uh, here in Chicago and where the southeast continues to really be hit the hardest. All right, I know a lot of you have already noted uh, that with Chicago passing 400 cases per day, we have seen that metric move into higher risk. So here in Chicago, we are now averaging 419 COVID diagnoses per day. And with that, we moved from substantial risk into higher risk. I want to note that the rest of the primary metrics that we track do remain in lower risk. Our test positivity is at 4.3%. We're averaging 193 people hospitalized with COVID across Chicago, not in the ICU, and 62 people hospitalized with COVID in the ICU. However, with that move into higher risk, we did want to take additional action. And so we are today announcing a new mandate as Chicago's case count moves into the higher transmission risk. Already, when we crossed that 200 case per day mark, we were recommending masks. And now, as we've crossed 400, masks are now required in indoor public settings in Chicago for all persons aged two years and older, beginning on Friday, August 20. This mandate will remain in place while Chicago's case count remains over 400 cases per day at that higher risk. Once we get through the Delta surge, I anticipate that will come back down. When we move and consistently are under 400 cases per day, it would revert to a mask recommendation. And when we move back under 200 cases per day, that recommendation would be removed. We also, just to put a little finer point on the, on the question of sort of what comes next, uh, we are not anticipating at this point adding additional business restrictions. However, we're watching what happens with these metrics. And if we see some of those hospital numbers start to move in ways that look untenable, as they have seen in the South, uh, or if we start to see, for example, our case count get to the very high risk category, over 800 cases per day, we may need to put further restrictions in place. But different than last year when we did not have a vaccine, a high case count does not automatically translate to a high hospitalization count and a high death count. And we're hopeful that having the masks in place for everybody will get us through Delta while we keep working on getting folks vaccinated. And with doing that, our goal is to remain open but careful. Ken will give some more details about the mass mandate in a minute. To talk about the rest of the data and put it in some perspective, uh, this is a graph and we will be posting all of this online if you're not able to see the details. Uh, just to show you that red line marks 400 cases per day. And 400 cases per day is, is concerning. It means that if you're out and about in Chicago, the risk of you potentially being exposed to someone uh, who has COVID has gone up. But just for some context, uh, in the first peak, we averaged about 1,000 cases per day at the peak and that's when not a lot of tests Testing was available. Uh, in our peak in November, December, we were averaging about 2,500 cases a day, with some days getting up close to 3,500. So 400 cases per day is concerning. It's why we're acting. But in terms of where we've been as a city, it is not a cause for alarm. It is a cause for caution. 
The main message is that people who are unvaccinated are at higher risk. We have a series of graphs, you'll be able to find these online, that are comparing at the top uh, rates of cases among the unvaccinated. So here in Chicago, we're seeing the highest rate among unvaccinated people, 30 to 59, followed by unvaccinated people, 18 to 29, followed by unvaccinated people, 12 to 17, followed by unvaccinated people over 60, and then way at the bottom still, are zero to 11 year olds who of course are not yet eligible for vaccine. But in comparison on the left bottom, you see partially vaccinated um, and then on the right bottom, fully vaccinated. And you, what, what you're seeing there is some breakthrough cases for sure, um, but we are broadly speaking still 99.7% of vaccinated Chicagoans have not been diagnosed with COVID after receiving a COVID vaccine. And here's what our hospitalization data looks like. Uh, so again, through the full pandemic, we got hit the hardest right at the beginning here, uh, averaging uh, nearly 200 hospitalizations per day. In the second peak, uh, we were close to 150. Uh, in May, as we saw the alpha variant come through, it was more in the 75 to 100 range per day. We're currently averaging 18 hospitalizations per day. And for our breakthrough infections, 99.99% of vaccinated Chicagoans have not been hospitalized with COVID-19 after vaccination. The vaccines continue to work very well. And for deaths, it's even better. We've been getting a lot of questions about how COVID is impacting children, particularly as we look toward the return to school. Uh, I've been addressing this on Facebook over the, this last week or two. We will continue to take a lot of child-focused questions, but wanted to share with you um, some hospitalization data for children. So this is June 1 to the present, and you see that um, among rates, 18 to 49-year-olds now are really who is getting hospitalized because they're less likely to be vaccinated. Um, however, uh, zero to 17-year-olds, which of course includes a lot of children not yet eligible for vaccination, that rate has remained low, uh, still at this point a little bit below one uh, childhood hospitalization, one child hospitalized per day here in Chicago. And if you look throughout the whole outbreak at what pediatric hospitalizations have looked like, this is going all the way back to March um, of last year, you see that at most points here, it's been in the one to two per day range um, at the peak, which matches our peak in, in Chicago um, in, in the November, December range up to about four uh, child hospitalizations per day. Again, that's when we were averaging um, about 2,500 cases per day. And in contrast, um, the worst in terms of adult hospitalizations was uh, nearly 50 times this at 200 hospitalizations per day. The hospitalization rate is really striking where we look at our Chicago data and how much that risk is falling on people who are unvaccinated. So this again, we focused on age here, knowing that there's interest in kids. The top graph is showing people who are unvaccinated. The gray are people who are over 60, who are unvaccinated and then hospitalized. That is our highest hospitalization rate. Next comes people who are in that 18 to 59 year old group, then 18 to 29. And again, the children are really continue to have very low rates. But then if you look in the bottom right, fully vaccinated, we're seeing almost nothing there. People who are fully vaccinated in Chicago, regardless of age, very unlikely to have a breakthrough hospitalization. And deaths, even more so. Uh, the highest death rate is among unvaccinated Chicagoans, 60 years and older. That's that gray on the top. Um, and again, this is this is going back over the last few months through the alpha surge to present. Um, and then in comparison, if you look on the bottom right for fully vaccinated, we're seeing almost nothing. So at this point, this really is largely, especially the severe outcomes of vaccine preventable disease. And if you've been waiting to get your vaccine, especially if you're over 60, Delta is here. Now now is the time we want to keep people safe and out of the hospital and vaccine clearly based on our Chicago data is the most important way to do that. We're still working on reaching both younger and older Chicagoans with vaccines. I'm happy to announce that more than 60% of Chicagoans in all age groups over 18 have now received at least a first COVID vaccine dose. 
dose and our adolescent vaccinations that are at 54 percent are growing the most quickly so we're still making progress a couple of just quick updates since last week the cdc has now more formally recommended vaccination for pregnant people uh, the american college of obstetrics and gynecologists the society for maternal fetal medicine had already been strongly recommending vaccines for pregnant people but with some new data cdc has now strengthened those guidelines people who are pregnant breastfeeding trying to get pregnant or might become pregnant in the future vaccine is recommended for all of them uh, and the data is showing the vaccine is safe for pregnant people they were not in the original trials, which is why this was not part as strongly in the original recommendations. But there have now been more than 125,000 people who have been uh, vaccinated while pregnant and followed up, and then more specific follow-up with 5,000 volunteers at CDC. We've seen no unexpected pregnancy or income, infant outcomes related to COVID vaccination. We've seen no increases in pregnancy loss or in preterm birth or in lower weight infants or congenital problems or in deaths compared to the background rate. Also, um, increasingly, there have been multiple studies showing the infant also gets some COVID protection when the mom is vaccinated. So multiple studies show this is something we also see with influenza vaccination. It's why we strongly recommend uh, pregnant women get vaccinated um, if they are pregnant during the, the flu season. Um, because infants get some level of protection when, when the mom is vaccinated. They get antibodies through the placenta and through the breast milk. And then finally, most importantly, there have now been more than 40 studies that have shown pregnant people and their unborn babies are at high risk for severe COVID-19 disease if they are infected. And the vaccine is the best way to prevent COVID infection. So pregnant people are more likely to need oxygen, to need ICU, to need a ventilator, or to die from a COVID infection than age-matched non-pregnant people. And they're more likely to have preeclampsia, which is a serious pregnancy complication, more likely to have their babies uh, born preterm or stillborn, and more likely to have newborns admitted to the um, neonatal ICU. So really a lot of data here, um, and that's been a question that we've been getting a lot. The other update, uh, and here's just some uh, information you'll find online um, as we're sharing out about vaccines and pregnancy. I would be remiss to not note that there is also no evidence that any vaccines, including the COVID vaccines, cause any fertility problems in women or men. That continues to be a piece of misinformation we see circulating. The other major piece of update, uh, the, the other major update to CDC guidance is that CDC is now recommending an additional dose of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. That's for people who got Pfizer or Moderna. So we're recommending a third dose only for people at this point whose immune systems are moderately to severely compromised. I know there was some news that came out about that. We'll talk, but I wanted to just highlight where we are. So people who have a severely compromised immune system, it's not that they can't get the vaccine. It's that we've seen many of them, because they're on medications to suppress their immune system, don't build up as much protection against COVID. But there were studies done that showed with a third dose, many of these people were able to achieve a level of protection. Uh, and importantly, the vaccines do continue to be strongly protective against severe illness and death caused by COVID, including seniors. So right now, there is no recommendation for additional doses or booster shots for any other population. And we will be sharing data and recommendations for booster shots for other populations as they emerge. There was some national news. Um, we've not seen that data yet at this point. The FDA, the CDC need to weigh in. Uh, I do think it's likely that we will be seeing more booster shots coming, but right now, only people who are moderately to severely immunocompromised. And to be more specific about that, right now here in Chicago across the United States, the people who should be getting a third dose um, of either Pfizer or Moderna are people who have been receiving acti active cancer treatment, people who have received an organ transplant and are taking medicine to suppress their immune system, people have who have received a stem cell transplant within the last two years or are taking medicine to suppress their immune system, people who have a moderate to severe primary immunodeficiency or people who have advanced or untreated HIV infection. So if you think you fall into one of these categories, please talk to your doctor who cares for you uh, for that condition and uh, talk to them about the timing of that dose. This is only for people who receive Pfizer and Moderna. It does not apply at this point to people who have received Johnson & Johnson. You should get that additional third dose 
at least 28 days after getting the second dose. Um, and if your vaccine, I'm sorry, if your healthcare provider can't provide the vaccine, you can self attest and receive the vaccine wherever we're offering it. So we will make this available through the Protect Chicago at Home program, um, but only for people with this immunocompromise. And incentives are not available for third or booster doses at this time. Our top priority, to be clear, remains ensuring that unvaccinated Chicagoans get their first or their second doses of vaccine. That remains the top priority, even as the conversation about booster shots continued, continues, getting people who are unvaccinated started on vaccine is the most important thing to protect everybody. I also just want to end uh, with some good news on where we're making vaccine progress. Uh, I want to give congratulations to two zip codes, 60644, that's Austin and West Garfield Park, and 60628, Roseland, Riverdale, Pullman, and others, uh, as two additional zip codes that have reached the important benchmark where the majority, at least half of people aged 12 plus in that zip code, have gotten at least a first dose. We only have four more zip codes to go, and every zip code will have hit that 50% mark. So we're really excited about that. Congrats to those zip codes. I also want to give a shout out to 60636. That's Englewood and West Englewood. They had the biggest increase in first dose vaccine coverage for those over 12 uh, since last week. And that we've continued to do a lot of this door-to-door -door work and bringing vaccine where it's needed um, and making good progress. I also, 50% uh, is kind of a bare minimum. We'd like to get everybody at least to 70%. I'd like to congratulate the 33 Chicago zip codes shaded in blue here that now have at least 70% first dose vaccine coverage for age 12 plus. That is our city average approximately. And new to the 70% threshold this week is 60630. That's Albany Park, Irving Park, Jefferson Park, and 60623, Brighton Park and North and South, South Lawndale. Uh, so making some really good progress. And then finally, just congrats to the nine Chicago zip codes that now have an 80% first dose vaccine coverage. We'd love everybody who's at 70 to at least get to 80. Um, and new this week there is 60. 613. That's Lakeview, North Center, Lincoln Square, and Uptown. Uh, COVID vaccines remain free, widely available. Most Chicagoans are getting vaccine from pharmacies. You can walk into Walgreens, Mariano's, Walmart, Jewel Osco, Costco, CVS. Um, there are appointments or walk in. You can also get vaccine through your health care provider. And as always, you can call Protect Chicago at home. Um, you can register online or call 312 746 4835. You can also continue to go to zocdoc.com slash vaccine. Uh, and with that, I will be happy to turn it over uh, to Ken Meyer, again, the Acting Commissioner at Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, to give some more details about the mask mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awadi. <clears throat> Put that away. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Ken Meyer. I am the Acting Commissioner for the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. I want to first and foremost thank our business community for continuing to adapt during the pandemic. It has been a rigorous road to recovery, but it has always been evident that Chicago's business owners are resilient. I have seen incredible collaboration and am proud of the progress we've made and will continue to make getting closer to ending this pandemic. My department's core mission is to protect consumers and workers and to support businesses, especially during these difficult times. In alignment with the CDC's guidance and the Chicago Department of Public Health, the city will mandate that businesses require masks for everyone, regardless of vaccination status, in all indoor public settings, effective this Friday, August 20th. Chicago, as Dr. Awadi just described, Chicago has surpassed a daily average of 400 new COVID cases. Businesses have stepped up in the past to keep our city safe, and we must do it again what is necessary to save lives. The new public health order does not include limits at public places. The mandate means that masks are required in, in, in all indoor public settings, including bars and restaurants, gyms, common areas of condos and multi-residential buildings, and private clubs. <clears throat> like previous mask mandates, masks can be removed at restaurants, bars, and other eating and drinking establishments by patrons when they are actively eating or drinking. Masks can also be removed for certain activities that require the removal, such as beard shaves or facials. 
Additionally, masks can be removed by employees in settings that are not open to the public if employees are static and maintaining at least six feet in social distancing. <clears throat> in crowded outdoor settings, masks are recommended for unvaccinated individuals. As a reminder, outdoor settings include sidewalk cafes, outdoor patios, rooms with re retractable roofs, and outdoor tents when their sides are open. Businesses seeking more information and guidance should visit www.chicago.gov backslash reopening. Chicago's businesses have stepped up repeatedly to keep their customers and employees safe, and we must once more do what is necessary to protect Chicago and save lives. <clears throat> the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection will be holding webinars this Thursday, August 19th at 10 a.m. and Friday, August 20th at 1 o'clock, same webinar, <clears throat> repeated, to provide an overview of the mask mandate. To register for the webinars, please visit www www.chicago.gov backslash business education. I encourage everyone, as the doctor just suggested, everyone get a vaccine that has not been vaccinated or get that second dose. Chicago residents who have not yet received vaccination should get vaccination as soon as possible. And I want to take a moment to thank the many businesses that have shown their dedication to their employees and patrons throughout this pandemic by strictly following the guidelines. We have made it this far because of you and relying on you to continue following the public health guidelines. We must stay diligent and commit to the public health guidance. We are, here not, we are not here to hurt businesses. We are here to protect all Chicagoans. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Mi nombre es la doctora Geraldine Luna y soy la directora médica del Departamento de Salud Pública de Chicago. Gracias por estar aquí en sintonía con nosotros. Tenemos eh, información que queremos compartir. Y la más importante del día de hoy es que el, CD, el CDPH o el Departamento de Salud Pública de Chicago agregó hoy ocho estados de aviso al viaje semanal. Minnesota, Nueva Jersey, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Utah, Virginia, West Virginia y el Distrito de Colombia ahora también se añaden a la lista de los viajeros. Ahora hay 39 estados y tres territorios en el aviso de viaje y todos superan la marca de 15 nuevos casos de COVID-19 por día por 100,000 habitantes. Se recomienda a todas las personas no vacunadas que viajen a estos lugares que obtengan un resultado negativo de la prueba de COVID-19 con no más de 72 horas antes de llegar a Chicago o que se pongan en una cuarentena de 10 días a partir de su llegada a Chicago. Las personas vacunadas no necesitan ponerse en cuarentena ni recibir una prueba negativa de COVID-19. El Departamento de Salud Pública también anunció hoy que restablecerá el mandato de mascarillas para todo entorno público interior ya que el número promedio de casos diarios de COVID-19 en Chicago ahora supera los 400. Toda persona, independientemente de su estado de vacunación, deberá usar una máscara a partir del viernes 20 de agosto, mientras estén interiores en lugares públicos. Con la variante Delta, altamente contagiosa y transmisible, que hace que aumente las tasas de caso, ahora es el momento de restablecer esta medida para evitar una mayor propagación y salvar vidas. Se, se continuará rastrea, rastreando los datos de cerca y hay esperanza de que solamente sea temporal. Podremos aplanar la curva como lo hemos hecho antes, pero todo depende también de la vacunación y del movimiento proactivo que estamos tratando de tener para bajar la transmisibilidad y diseminación de esta enfermedad. Los entornos públicos interiores incluyen bares, restaurantes, gimnasios, áreas comunes de condominio y edificios de múltiples residencias y clubes privados son áreas también que deberán implementarse. Esto es mandatorio. De manera similar a los mandatos de máscara anteriores, la clientela puede quitarse la máscara en restaurantes y bares y otros establecimientos para comer, beber o cuando esté comiendo, bebiendo y otras actividades que no incluyan 
o que se incluyan como parte del de el proceso de ir a un restaurante. Mientras no esté haciendo ninguna de estas actividades, por favor, se les va a pedir que usen su máscara en todo tiempo. Las máscaras se pueden quitar para ciertas actividades que requieren su eliminación también como afeitados de barba o tratamientos faciales. Las máscaras siguen siendo obligatorias en los transportes públicos. Eso no ha cambiado. En entornos de atención médicas, escuela, correccionales y de congregación, la nueva orden de salud pública no incluye límites de capacidad en lugares públicos y el enmascaramiento sigue siendo opcional en entornos al aire libre, donde el riesgo de la transmisión del COVID-19 se ha visto que es menor. Se recomiendan máscaras para personas no vacunadas en entornos al aire libre con mucha gente, especialmente si tienen condiciones crónicas o que los pongan a riesgo de, trans, de recibir, de contagiarse con el COVID-19. Debido a que más del 70% de los adultos de Chicago han recibido al menos una de las dosis de la vacuna, las tasas de hospitalización y muerte por COVID-19 en Chicago son mucho más bajas que en el 2020 con la misma tasa de casos que tenemos ahorita. Pero en el recuento de casos que ahora vuelve a este nivel, el riesgo ha aumentado para todos, incluso para aquellos que están vacunados. El momento de actuar es ahora para evitar una mayor propagación. Los habitantes de Chicago que aún no han sido vacunados deben vacunarse lo antes posible. Los protegerá a usted y a los seres queridos del riesgo de, enfer de enfermedades graves o la presentación severa del COVID-19, hospitalizaciones y la muerte. También la CDC acaba de recomendar el refuerzo de la tercera vacuna en Moderna y también de Pfizer para personas que tienen condiciones inmunosuprimidas. Estamos hablando de trasplante eh, de órganos, personas recibiendo activamente quimioterapias, pero para el resto de la población no es una indicación en este momento. La protección sigue siendo superior. Así que para estas personas, por favor, si tienen eh, designaciones eh, hogar médico eh, en sus doctores, por favor que, le, que les dé más información e instrucción de cómo va a ser, cómo va a recibir ese nuevo refuerzo. Y la CDC define cuatro niveles de transmisión comunitaria, bajo, moderado, sustancial y alto. Según la población de Chicago, la ciudad se encuentra en la categoría alta de transmisión local de la CDC cuando se diagnostica más de 400 casos nuevos de COVID-19 por día. La tasa de casos promedio diaria aumentó a 4.19 el lunes. Empresas que busquen más información deben visitar chicago.gov barra inclinada reopening. El Departamento de Asuntos Comerciales y Protección al Consumidor de Chicago, BACP, llevará a cabo seminarios web el jueves 19 de agosto a las 10 de la mañana y el viernes 20 de agosto a la 1 de la tarde para proporcionar una descripción general del mandato de máscara. Para registrarse, visite por favor el chicago.gov barra inclinada Business Education. Las empresas de Chicago se han esforzado repetidamente para mantener seguros a sus clientes y empleados. Entonces debemos hacer una vez más lo necesario para salvar vidas. Por favor, vacúnense y quédense en casa cuando estén enfermos o tengan síntomas. Y usen la máscara para evitar la transmisión de este virus tan transmisible y contagioso. Gracias a todos y manténganse a salvo, Chicago. So either of us are happy to take questions. And there's one on that side of the room too. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Arwadi. Um, my question for you is this mandate goes further than current CDC guidelines for high risk transmission areas in the sense that those guidelines recommend but do not mandate the use of masks for vaccinated and unvaccinated people in indoor settings. Why the decision by the city to go further than those CDC guidelines and issue a mandate? Yeah, so we've seen many places around the country actually move to do a mandate, particularly at that high risk setting. So we're certainly not alone in doing that. Um, I do think it marks a 
different point where we are crossing these thresholds. Um, and I want Chicagoans to understand that the risk does go up uh, when the rates are going up. And so uh, we've already seen most settings in Chicago using these masks. And as we've been learning more about Delta, learning more about breakthroughs, recognizing that even vaccinated people were starting to see, although the numbers look good here in Chicago, we're you know seeing in places where it's surging that it is more of an issue. Uh, our goal is to stay open. I don't expect that this will be an indefinite forever mask uh, requirement. And that's why we've also been very clear that we're on the way up now. I expect that we'll come back down. And when we get back um, under that threshold is when we would drop it. So um, I really think, again, it's based on um, what we've learned from COVID to date and wanting to minimize the risk for everybody, including those not yet eligible for vaccination. Uh, Brooke. Rob Snee with WGN News. Um, I wanted to know, can we say without certainty that Lollapalooza is in no way connected to the surge in the numbers you just acknowledged today and the mass mandate you just delivered? Yeah, there's. we're not seeing any connection related to Lollapalooza. We've not had new data suggesting it was a super spreader. We've not seen any change in terms of uh, the demographics here in Chicago. As you know, at our highest case rates actually are in people in their 30s and 40s, not the demographic really at Lollapalooza. Um, so yes, we see no connection uh, between that event or any of the other large events that we've had to date um, and uh, this recommendation. Doctor, will there be an enforcement component to go with this new mask mandate or is that going to be left to the businesses? And if it is left to the businesses, will they get help from the city in that regard? Sure. Um, so I will I will uh, hand it to Ken just to talk a little bit in detail. So, you know, I'll tell you, this is this is a place where we have been before and you have seen uh, us, you know, do some enforcement where that's been necessary. We expect most businesses will comply here um, at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Our restaurant inspectors, for example, that are out, you know, will be looking for masks. And I'll hand it to you if you want to add some more detail. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, you know, this week we will communicate with the business community. We'll do, we have about 65, 60, 65,000 that um, we will e-blast, give them the new guidelines. As I said in my statement, we'll do a training um, Thursday morning and again, same training on Friday afternoon. We found since we've been in this now for 18 months that the more we educate the business community and also with the help, obviously, of the media, uh, getting the word out there, we find that most businesses are in compliance. My enforcement team will do, and I'm sure Dr. Awadis will do, active compliance. So that is, if we do go into establishment and we see you know, a patron or two maybe not um, participating in the mandate of wearing a mask, we may give the business owner a warning and just kind of have them improve the uh, improve their behavior inside the business obviously if there's something egregious there's a big party no social distance uh, you know no social distancing no one's wearing a mask we then can obviously enforce and uh, write a citation but primarily this week we don't really want to hurt the businesses the reason we're doing this on a Tuesday the mandate goes in on Friday is to give everyone three or four days to kind of get acclimated train train uh, the business owners they can train their staffs and also just the community at large <coughs> Erica Maldonado, Univision Chicago. Uh, Dr. Arwadi, oh, here. Hi. Um, at the beginning of middle of July, you have mostly um, alpha and beta circulated in Chicago, and delta was kind of in the middle range. Can you tell us what is the uh, um, how widespread right yes. now is delta in Chicago? And also, what would be the message for vaccinated people um, that might get reinfected, even if they don't end up in the hospital? Right. Um, so uh, Delta has very much arrived here. We estimate that really almost all, more than 95% um, of cases at this point uh, here in Chicago, across Illinois, the Midwest, the US are the Delta variant. Uh, that's because it is so much more contagious than the ones that have come before. It has really outcompeted, and we're not seeing very much um, of uh, other other variants at this point. So really, when someone is getting infected with COVID at this point in Chicago, it is, it is almost always uh, Delta. And for folks who are vaccinated, um, can you remind me, you asked, Sorry, Dana. Yes, uh, I ask if um, now that that is the main strain yes. circulating, and even even uh, the fact that the numbers that you uh, are managing yes. doesn't point to a high right. breakthrough infection. Nevertheless, that is really hard to count because most of the breakthrough infections might be asymptomatic. Yes. Hence, you don't know. Exactly. And I'm telling you because I'm one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And so. 
Hence my question, what is really the message for vaccinated people that might get reinfected or infected with Delta? Yes, definitely. Uh, so, and thank you for repeating that. So, um, you know, part of this mask recommendation right now, uh, or mask mandate at this point, um, is recognizing that there are vaccinated Chicagoans uh, who very well, you know, could have been reinfected uh, with COVID and not known it uh, if they're not testing, et cetera. We are seeing, you know, some symptomatic breakthrough infections. Every single time someone is diagnosed with COVID in the city of Chicago, we match that person's uh, information to see, did they have COVID in the past? were they vaccinated? Were they partially vaccinated? Were they fully vaccinated? So we do, you know, this 99.7% uh, is for anybody who's been tested, but there may be some more. Um, I think, you know, the there is this, the, some conversation that was that was already getting out uh, even ahead of FDA or CDC guidance today around boosters. Um, and I think we may see additional boosters coming down uh, the line here. But at this point, you know, I'm someone who's almost eight months from having gotten my first COVID vaccine. I'm not changing uh, my behavior in any way. I'm not looking for another booster dose at this point. Um, I've already been wearing my mask in indoor settings, and that's what we're asking um, people to do. And, you know, broadly, again, the most important thing for vaccinated people that they could do is talk to people who aren't vaccinated and try to, you know, convince them um, or talk to them about that decision, because it's, it's, it is those folks who are driving most of uh, most of our COVID cases and then definitely the hospitalizations and deaths. There is another question in the community which mm -hmm. is... Yeah, there is another question in the community which basically is you might have get infected last year with alpha all or mm -hmm. beta. How likely are you to get reinfected with Delta, given the fact that it's so, so contagious? Yeah, it's a good question. And this is why I mentioned not only do we look for a history of previous uh, vaccination, but we look for that history of prior infection because we're interested in that. And what we see, you know, we know that people who have recovered from COVID have some level of protection, but it's not as high, it's not as strong, and it's not as good as if people are also vaccinated, especially with the Delta variant is what we're seeing. Seeing. Um, and, you know, if you look in South America, for example, uh, in Brazil, one of the very large cities there, they thought they had reached herd immunity because so many people had gotten COVID naturally. Uh, but then when the new variant came through, they saw another huge surge. And so just as a reminder to folks that even if you did have COVID previously or you've been tested and you have antibodies, the recommendation absolutely is that you should still get a COVID vaccine. It helps protect you against Delta. It helps protect against those severe outbreaks. Outcomes. And there's actually been some data that suggests people who had both natural infection and a vaccine probably are among the most protected of, of, of everybody. So that 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 is um, that recommendation is, is still very much there. In 400 cases, this is the benchmark for an indoor mask mandate. Mm -hmm. What would be the number or the numbers that would compel a reexamination of CPS's reopening plans? Oh, so where we look at CPS, um, you know, we've learned so much about how to keep schools open and safe during COVID. And when you look back to last, you know, a year ago, uh, when we were, when all the schools around Chicago were making decisions, and we were actually in a fairly similar place in terms of case counts, um, at that point, there was a lot of worry that opening schools in person could lead to potentially significant outbreaks. Um, but what we saw, uh, both here in Chicago and across the country, was that when places moved ahead with in-person school, with mitigation, with masks, with distancing, with these things in place, even before a vaccine um, was available, that it was very possible uh, to not only have school open, but to not see major outbreaks in schools, driving rates in communities. And right here in Chicago, uh, the archdiocese, for example, which is the largest private school system in the U.S., you know, was open throughout the school year, really at about full capacity, um, and didn't. And we saw lower rates of COVID for kids and staff in that school compared to the general community. So we are not reconsidering at all uh, the opening of school. And obviously, it's a it, CPS makes that that decision. Um, but we are 100% moving ahead um, with in-person education on August 30th, and that is the right thing to do. They've obviously, in addition to all of the things that were in place last year, um, adding a vaccine requirement uh, for staff, I think, is great. They're really showing major leadership on there. They'd already announced universal masking even before the CDC or the governor, um, you know, made that recommendation or, or put that in place. Um, and they're really we're doing a lot to try to 
promote vaccination in those settings. They've uh, required vaccination for student athletes, for example, um, and really trying to do everything we can. Just as I say, I want to keep Chicago open, uh, but also be careful. We want to keep schools open, uh, but also be careful. And we'll be balancing those and having lots of testing and lots of mitigation, all the ventilation, all these things in place. But there's been a lot of indirect effects from not having kids in school in person and our top goal is to make sure kids can remain in school in a setting um, that 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 puts their safety first is there a number you can give on hospitalizations cases etc that would yeah, so, um, you know, there are ongoing conversations, you know, with CPS, with um, with CTU, and we actually talked about this last year as well, if you recall, where we, uh, so, you know, if we were all, because there have been times when all of those metrics have been up in the very highest risk category, for example, um, meaning the cases, the positivity, you know, the hospitalizations, the ICUs. Um, and we had, you know, we had thought about even if we're over a high positivity and increasing quickly, might there need to be, um, um, you know, a pause of some kind. Really though, in practice, I think what's more likely is this individual school conversation, right? We're going to see quarantine. Um, there will be cases for sure in schools, not just CPS in schools. It's, it's not that COVID is gone. Uh, and we'll continue to do the things that helped keep those settings uh, safe last year. Um, and so it's more likely that you would see, uh, you know, a classroom, for example, um, potentially needing to quarantine or the, at least the unvaccinated students uh, in that classroom needing to quarantine. If you were seeing a number of significant um, quarantine or outbreak settings in a school, maybe an individual school would close. Um, I, For me, if we were to see a variant emerge that the vaccine really did not protect against, uh, that would be one of the things that would be a real game changer for me in terms of thinking about you know, what do we need to do at the whole societal level, um, potentially differently. In the absence of a new variant emerging, um, we will monitor what the risk is and the rate is uh, for kids in school um, and continue to follow along. Um, but I, you know, we're, 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 we're not at all thinking about moving um, away from that right now. And even when CPS came back, if you look at where we were, you know, in January and, and, and phase again, I mean, we were over a thousand cases per day really there. Um, but we had learned that that setting with mitigation uh, can be um, can be safe and appropriate for in-school learning. Dr. Hi, Dana Kozlov at CBS2. Just to be clear, so I, I want to make sure I understand. Mm -hmm. So 400 cases a day was the threshold that triggered the indoor mask mandate. What is the threshold where that mask mandate would be removed? So when we get back below 400 and consistently stay there. So uh, the idea is, um, and if, if you don't mind, I'll just pull this back up because it's helpful to probably see it very first slide. So this is the exact same metric that we've been using all along. And you can see like those cases per day, we moved into higher risk uh, when we're between 400 and 799 cases per day. When we drop back to substantial risk, we would expect the mask would drop back to a recommendation. So between 200 and 399. And if we can drop back to lower risk, that's when we would probably drop that mask recommendation. We will also though be following those other metrics, the test positivity and particularly that hospital capacity um, as we make some of those decisions. But these are the same metrics we've used all along. We've seen all of those metrics at the very high risk point uh, when we've been in major surges. We've enjoyed them all being in the lower risk right now. Um, and our goal is to, you know, really keep the risk down, continue to protect the healthcare system and work on getting people vaccinated. Uh, just a couple quick follow ups. Mm -hmm. Just when you say, and I'm sorry, I did not memorize all of the metrics yeah. from when you say consistently stay there in the lower risk, 20 to 199 cases, mm -hmm. that consistently is what time frame? Yeah. I mean, at least I would say one to two weeks. Um, we just want to be sure that we were coming down and a little bit would depend on, you know, the timing of when our press conferences were, et cetera. But we're not looking for a month underneath that. We want to be confident we're coming down off the surge um, and expect that we're staying there. We would then um, anticipate moving back to a mask recommendation at that point uh, and then similarly on the way back. And we're trying, you know, we've really tried to use these same thresholds throughout the whole pandemic to try to give people something we're following. Like we're not just pulling this out of the sky. It is based on risk um, and um, you know we want to be as open as we can be um, while remaining careful okay and then finally um, there are no capacity limits at this time at what point 
might you consider an indoor capacity limit again? Yeah, so um, there, I'd, I'd say there's a couple of answers to that. You know, one is if we start getting back up to very high risk, right? We start really getting over that 800 cases a day, or more importantly, if we start seeing those hospital numbers um, start to look problematic, those are things, um, and especially the hospital capacity, that we would need to take some more specific action on because there are parts of the country that um, are surging in ways that are stretching their hospitals in ways that are not acceptable. There are there are hospitals that can't take patients, you know, who've had a car accident or are having a heart attack because they're so overwhelmed with COVID. And in parts of Florida, there are higher rates of hospitalization per person uh, right now than we ever had in Chicago at the worst of it. And we will not let that happen here. So if we start to see increases, particularly in those severe outcomes, we probably would need to make um, you know, some more limits because we've got to make sure we protect our health care system and we've got to keep working on getting people vaccinated. Dr. Arwadi, here again. Yes. Uh, I know that this is very hard to predict, but nevertheless, this is our third big wave to put a name on it. Um, given the fact that uh, at, the, at the rate that this is increasing, how do you expect it progresses and well fourth according to that <laughs> okay um how do you expect it to progress and how high do you expect the peak to be? I know it's very hard to answer, but <laughs> yes. given that we have some experience. Yeah, so so what I can say is that, of course, I don't know the exact answer to that. But what we can predict is that we've been following very closely what's been happening with the Delta surges internationally as well as here in the U.S. And we do have some benefit of having been in quite good control and so being a little later to this delta surge than a lot of the country was which is really quite a bit less vaccinated than chicago is and so if you look um the first two big surges that we had were really before vaccine was available that third surge in kind of april and may that was really alpha coming through that was when michigan got hit really hard um and we were not sure where that was going to go because it wasn't something we were seeing across the whole country um but in terms of the outcomes, we saw hospitalizations and deaths go up a bit, um, but nothing like we'd seen previously. I'm hopeful that this July um, kind of August surge will look more like that April May surge. It may be a little higher uh, based on what we're seeing around the country. I am not expecting at this point for us to see anything like what we saw in November, December. Um, and we would act if we saw, you know, in terms of if we needed to put additional limitations in place, um, if we had a concern, um, particularly related to the, the health care system. So um, I have been alarmed by how quickly Delta has spread. Um, I think it's shown that the virus can mutate very quickly, and I'm the most worried about the potential for new variants that could emerge that the vaccines are not protective against, um, and then all bets are off. Uh, but I think for this surge, um, you know, I expect that for the next, you know, few weeks to month or two uh, is will be when we'll be sort of hopefully getting through this surge. Um, and uh, there still are a lot of people in Chicago who have no protection against COVID at all, even including those who are, um, we, we do some serologic tests to see what percentage of Chicagoans have had COVID, whether or not they know it, and then the, and combine that with the people who have been immunized. And we estimate there's still more than 800,000 Chicagoans who have no immunity at all. So there is a lot of room here to grow, and we really, really like those people to get vaccinated as opposed to taking their chances with COVID. One or the other is likely to happen. Thank you. Hi. Is there any evidence that the city's recommendation two and a half weeks ago that people wear masks had any impact on the data or the spread of cases? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, we certainly, Chicago generally has been quite good about masking and we saw many people really put those back on. Um, it's always a little bit difficult to kind of tease out which of the mitigation efforts are in place. I've certainly been reasonably pleased if you look at that increase that it has been uh, relatively slowed uh, compared to certainly what we've seen in some other parts of the country. Um, I. 
I can't imagine what decision making is happening in some parts of the country where they're seeing these exponential case rises, hospitalizations full, and haven't even moved to masks. So I'm confident that that, that has made a difference because it, it was one of the main tools that we had prior to the vaccine. Um, I think the vac our relatively higher vaccination rate is playing a more important role, but I do think masks are making a difference. Um, and we're all, you know, they're, they're one of the easiest tools uh, that we have. But it's an interesting question. I'll ask my epidemiologist. Since the masks are one of the more effective techniques, as you said, do you regret not ordering a mask mandate two and a half weeks ago? Perhaps we wouldn't be above 400 at that point? No, I don't think so. I, I really... Um our goal is to really try to communicate risk and, and what is needed at any point. And uh, we've sat sort of in that 200 to 400 range. I mean, that's sort of has been our traditional place where our cases have been um, throughout. Our testing has also remained very good. It's important people not just think about the cases, but the fact that that positivity is remaining below 5% because there are parts of the country, even like Indiana next door, that is testing a whole lot less. So their case number looks lower, but their positivity rate is really high. Um, and so I'm very pleased with where we are. We've seen testing increase appropriately. Big message, anybody with any COVID symptoms needs to get tested, regardless of vaccination status. If folks do that, pair that with the masks. Um, and, you know, and, and the idea is there are different thresholds of risk. Um, so I, this this is something we've been thinking about for some time, um, and I think it's the right approach. Couple more. Is a vaccine oh, mandate? Oh, hold, hold on, hold on. I, I'm still not done. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, before, after Lollapalooza, you said you expected to see about 200 cases yeah. tied to Lollapalooza. How many cases do you expect to see with kids going back to school starting August 30th? Oh, it's a hard question. I think, um, you know, there is likely to be a lot of testing in schools, right? Uh, uh, CPS, for example, is making testing available um, for students and staff on a weekly basis, if that's something that parents are interested in. We're going to be looking for it hard. There's going to be a lot of um, um, uh, attention because uh, diagnosing COVID is also important, right? Where you're thinking about trying to limit that risk. Um, so I expect we'll see some of those case rates go up a little bit, but what we've seen, like not just here, but across the country is that what we see with the rates of um, child uh, diagnoses, cases, deaths, really matches more what's happening in the community than it does whether or not we're seeing kids in school. And so my expectation is that we would see cases among children uh, rise at the same rate that we're seeing them rise within the community, um, assuming that we're doing all of uh, the right things for mitigation in school, and I feel confident that we are. So not knowing exactly where the community cases will go, I can't make an exact prediction, um, but I we've seen all along them rise and fall. And, and again, the highest risk is being um, exposed to unvaccinated people at home. Uh, and so having, you know, if you're worried about your child in school, please make sure the adults around them, especially at home, um, are vaccinated. Okay, one last question. Mm -hmm. What do you say to parents who are who, whose kids aren't eligible to be vaccinated and are watching you and are sort of hearing the concern in your voice saying, please start wearing a mask again? Mm -hmm. What do you say to them if they are just really, really worried about sending their kids back to school? How do you how is it we have to wear masks, but at the same time, it's it's safe to send your yeah. precious babies to school? Yeah. So um, first, you'll note that we we're requiring masks in school settings, which I felt very, very strongly about, knowing that that is something that um, absolutely has been shown to help uh, protect um, against uh, COVID transmission, including among kids. Um, I also think, you know, what we have seen very clearly, and I think you know, Chicago Department of Public Health, once we got some additional data and saw that we were able to be open in school, we have been very strong advocates for in-school education because we've seen so much learning loss, so much problems with, you know, social, emotional, all of the supports that kids get in school. Um, and I'm worried about the potential of months or years, you know, of our children not getting the education that they deserve. Our top goal is making sure that kids can get that education with the safety things in place. Um, you know, I don't have children myself, but my own nieces and nephews were in school in person last year. They'll be in person uh, this year. And um, I really feel strongly that when we do this in a smart way, which I do think we are doing here, um, we can be in school and that the risk benefit, which is always what we're thinking about there, very, very strongly falls on uh, the benefit side. 
a vaccine mandate for customers at indoor venues as other cities have instituted is that off the table in chicago it's not entirely off the table um, at this point we've seen uh, new york and now san francisco really move in that direction with slightly different flavors on those um, and i'm actually very interested to see what kind of impact that has um, and i i am very pleased um, with individual settings that are making those decisions right we've seen bars and restaurants and clubs and venues uh, here in Chicago uh, and, and around the country make that decision to um, require either vaccine or in some cases vaccine or a recent negative test. That is a best practice. Um, where we think about sort of doing that at a city level, that's the sort of thing that, you know, we, we would a, want to make sure there was a way to implement from a tax standpoint. We've been thinking about what some of that looks like. Uh, I think also in a mandate kind of way, we would need to be at a much higher risk, just frankly, uh, recognizing that um, there are um, you know, there are people who have still not made that decision to get vaccinated, and I got to make sure they're able to access go to the grocery store, you know, can do these things that uh, are required sort of, um, you know, within life. And I think there are different cities have been drawing some different lines there in terms of what is essential, what is um, what is uh, optional. Uh, we are more very much encouraging employers to mandate that vaccine for their employees and to tell the world when they do that. I feel much more comfortable going to my dentist that I know has all of the staff vaccinated, going to restaurants restaurants where I know everybody, you know, on staff has been vaccinated. Um, and we're planning to sort of lift up businesses that have made that decision in terms of their employees. It's also the most important thing for creating as safe a workplace as we can. Um, and then when you add on to that, especially in some of these higher risk settings, universities, healthcare, um, or places where you have to take your mask off to participate in the activity, um, really varies in support of people doing that. Uh, we're not considering a mandate of this at this point, but I think I want to see what happens in some of these other cities. And it's not entirely off the table. You'd go to capacity limits first, capacity yes. limits first before that. Uh, I expect so. Thanks, everybody.